You're listening to audio from The Village Church, a community that's formed by the gospel and sent on God's mission, gathering weekly in the heart of downtown Hamilton, Ohio. For more information about The Village or to connect with us, you can find us online at myvillagechurch.com. 1 Samuel 28, starting in verse 3. By this time, Samuel had died. All Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, his city, and Saul had removed removed the mediums and spiritists from the land. The Philistines gathered and camped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel, and they camped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistines' camp, he was afraid, and his heart pounded. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him in dreams or by the Urim or by the prophets. Saul then said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium, so I can go and consult her. His servants replied, There is a woman at Endor who is a medium. Saul disguised himself by putting on different clothes and set out with two of his men. They came to the woman at night, and Saul said, Consult a spirit for me. Bring up for me the one I tell you. But the woman said to him, You surely know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why are you setting a trap for me to get me killed? Then Saul swore to her by the Lord, As surely as the Lord lives, no punishment will come to you from this. Who is it that you want me to bring up for you? The woman asked. Bring up Samuel for me, he answered. When the woman saw Samuel, she screamed, and then she asked Saul, Why did you deceive me? You are Saul. But the king said to her, Don't be afraid. What do you see? I see a spirit form coming up out of the earth, the woman answered. Then Saul asked her, What does he look like? An old man is coming up, she replied. He's wearing a robe. Then Saul knew that it was Samuel, and he knelt low with his face on to the ground and paid homage. Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Samuel asked Saul. I'm in serious trouble, replied Saul. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has turned away from me. He doesn't answer me anymore, either through the prophets or in dreams. So I've called on you to tell me what I should do. Samuel answered, Since the Lord has turned away from you and has become your enemy, why are you asking me? The Lord has done exactly what he said through me. The Lord has torn the kingship out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David. You did not obey the Lord and did not carry out his burning anger against Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will also hand Israel over to the Philistines along with you. Tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me, and the Lord will hand Israel's army over to the Philistines. Immediately, Saul fell flat on the ground. He was terrified by Samuel's words and was also weak because he had not eaten anything all day and all night. The woman came over to Saul, and she saw that he was terrified, and said to him, Look, your servant has obeyed you. I took my life in my hands and did what you told me to do. Now please, listen to your servant. Let me set some food in front of you. Eat it, and it will give you strength so you can go on your way. He refused, saying, I won't eat. But when his servants and the woman urged him, he listened to them. He got up off the ground and sat on the bed. The woman had a fattened calf at her house, and she quickly slaughtered it. She also took flour, kneaded it, and baked unleavened bread. She served it to Saul and his servants, and they ate. Afterwards, they got up and left that night. This is the word of the Lord. You can now be seated. Good morning. My name is Michael. One of the pastors here, uh, thanks for this. If we if we were a cooking show, we would be. This would be the holidays, uh, Halloween spooktacular. Uh, special. And, um, you know, we put a sermon series together a year in advance. And so here we are, you know, um, who would have thought that we get to talk about ghosts on such a day, you know, uh, I'm going to spend the next two days just unpacking all of the stuff in here and it should be really great. So let me pray and then we'll jump in. God, thanks for just music and song and, and that we can pray to you not by our own works, not by our own identity, but for what you secure for us in Jesus, that we get to pray in his name, we get to sing in his name, we get to worship purely in his name, and we get to gather together uh, as just your clumsy kids trying to figure stuff out together. And um, thanks for days like this um, that, that might just feel like an average, just an average day. Would you let us delight in you for those who find themselves in def- desperate places today? Would you let them find that, that you are the only one that can deliver them from desperation? And for us who find ourselves 
uh, not in desperate places today, would you show us how desperate we really are apart from you? Thanks for your goodness and your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1692, the small Puritan community in Salem, Massachusetts, was gripped by a wave of paranoia, speculative paranormal, and accusations of witchcraft. What began with a few young girls experiencing or claiming to experience some strange fits and visions quickly spiraled into a frenzy of public trials and executions. Nearly 200 were tried, 20 were put to death, most of them by hanging. This, as you probably know, is known as the Salem Witch Trials, and they were a dark chapter indeed, a disastrous example of a fear and desperation at work to drive people toward destructive and dangerous and insufficient sources of hope and life. <clears throat> when faced with the unknown, terrifying circumstances, fear won the day on that day, and families were shattered, and lives were, were ruined and ended. They desperately grasped for explanations and control in a world that seemed to be spiraling out of control. This tragic episode, it helps us today connect uh, our story in 1 Samuel, and it's sort of flipped in some ways, but, but King Saul, in a moment of desperation, he seeks guidance from a, a medium, right? He, he's, he's searching for life beyond death, an act that was strictly forbidden by God in the scriptures, and like the people of Salem, Saul, he allows desperation to lead him down a path contrary to the foundations of of the way of life and the foundations of his faith. So the big idea that we're talking about today is, is this desperate times call for desperate measures. Desperate times call for desperate measures. You may be familiar with one Angus MacGyver, right? His his name is actually a verb now that we use to fashion something creative to get yourself out of a desperate situation, all right? And so for those of you who don't know, uh, MacGyver was a, a TV show, and there's a reboot. Um, I don't think anyone's ever watched that, but there's a reboot recently. It's fine. I'm sure it's fine. Uh, I have not watched it. That was unfair. So uh, I, I remember being a kid. This was in the 80s, and, and I, remember, I remember him getting, like, overtaken by an avalanche, and, and I'm, I'm almost positive he had bubble gum and, and like, a, a ski, you know, stick, and he made, like, a signal flare. I'm pretty sure he made that out of that. And I looked up some stuff, some of his uh, more notable acts of getting out of desperate situations. He had a chocolate bar and magnesium from a car wheel. He created an explosive. Um, he had jumper cables, a generator, 50 cents in quarters. He created an arc welder. Um, he used satellite parts and a plastic shield to create a hang glider. He had a blood pressure pump and an alarm clock, and he created a lie detector, right? That's, um, that's pretty good. He had a ball, a kerosene, newspaper, and cotton. He created a hot air balloon. He was, he was pretty good at what he did, right? And so what, what we see is desperate times call for desperate measures. And, and when fear and uncertainty cloud vision where do we turn? That's the thing, and there's a lot of stuff, a lot of rocks to, to look under in this passage, and we won't do that. I just promise you will be let down by all this stuff we don't, all this stuff I don't say today, all right? But, but what we know is, is when fear and uncertainty cloud our vision, we get to look at where we turn, and what does desperation draw out of us? On the front end, we, we will hit on the spiritual nature of, of what's happening, but 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 that has much less to do uh, with mediums and much more to do with the nature of, of the human heart, including our own. Desperate times call for desperate measures. And what that means is when, when facing ruin, humanity will sometimes turn in their desperation to any resource that they think will give them some hope, some direction. And so it was with Saul. And so hopping in here, uh, kind of three chunks that, that help us see desperation in a, in a unique way. The first thing is, is desperation comes from fear. 
Now you'll notice that word often is struck out because I think desperation often comes from fear, but I might think that desperation uh, always comes from fear, but I'm not quite confident enough, so I put it on the screen with a strike through, okay? So desperation certainly often comes from fear, but it might always come from fear. So let's hop in and read, uh, starting in verse 3, 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 3. By this time, Samuel had died, and, and we can't catch everyone up, but Samuel was a prophet of God's people. He's the one that that uh, God used to actually anoint Saul as king. So Saul is king of God's people. Samuel had died. All Israel had mourned for him and buried him uh, in his city. And Saul had removed the mediums and the spiritists from the land. So Saul was king, and he was, he was doing the right thing. He, he was obeying God and, and what he had told them about uh, these type of people and these type of things. The Philistines, when you read about the Philistines in the Old Testament, just assume that they are God's uh, enemy, and so that's what's happening here. They've been fighting with Saul in Israel for a long time. The Philistines gathered and they camped at, uh, such, an, uh, at such a place. So Saul gathered all Israel and they camped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistine camp, he was afraid and his heart pounded. That's what sets all this up. In fact, there's lots of questionable uh, events that happen and actions that are made, but, but Saul is afraid and his heart pounded. Nerves, sweaty palms, uh, twitching eyes, and everyone looks on. And, and when we read narratives in the Old Testament, the beauty is, is this was thousands of years ago. Um, but, but when we read the storyline in the Old Testament, we get to lean in and peel back layers. And what we see is, is ancient emotion connecting with us in our very moment, in our very day. He was afraid and his heart pounded. If, if there's any room for empathy for, for Saul, it is, it is in, this, in this point. It comes from Saul's inner turmoil. Something that we can certainly connect with, that we can certainly identify with, whether you are a king or not. It, it, it doesn't seem like in this moment that Saul is arrogantly navigating uh, this difficult situation, but he is scared inside and out. He is scared. Uh, he, he has demonstrated to this point, and, and we, to be fair, gosh, could you imagine your life being written down like this? And, and it's not from you, and so people just tell the ins and the outs, and, and my guess is that you might not look great on every page written, all right? And so Saul has been something that, that, that's, he, he's somewhat difficult to like get a handle on because he seems to do right things sometimes and just dead wrong things at other times. Lately, he has been opposing the Lord just outwardly, right? So he has demonstrated emotional and, and trauma responses. He clearly suffers from, from mental health and anger issues. He has been unraveling, and there have been threads being pulled, especially when pressed, he has lost Samuel, who was the constant uh, intermediate between him and the Lord, his spiritual guide and influence, the one that set him on this path. Uh, his identity as, as chaser of David is on pause with no resolve. David has fled. Uh, and, and so Saul has been, literally, his identity is just to chase David. He wakes up and he says, where's David? And so that's kind of like up in the air and there's no resolve there. And he's in deep. His back is against the wall or against, you know, an ocean. All has been lost. He doesn't know where to turn. So before we kind of untangle Saul's response, which is tough, we get to sit with him just for a moment. What makes you desperate? When is the last time you were afraid and, and, you, and you trembled? What's a recent time where you did that? What would, what would make you do that? And as I was thinking about this this week, I, I just thought, like, my goodness, like, as a preface, humans are, are pretty remarkable. We can imagine unimaginable situations and difficulty and it just seems, and I'm not like, you know me, I'm not like the most optimistic guy, right? I'm not just like feeding you fluff, but, but there is like some level of a, of a human's ability to rise above, to, to just get by. And, and the reason why I say this, it's, it's actually quite rare to find ourselves desperate. And certainly we know people who are desperate. We know people who are in desperate situations or circumstances, and maybe you could point to one. 
But it's, it's quite rare for someone to just look you dead in the eyes and say, I am desperate. Or for, or for us to look at ourselves in the mirror and, and, and say the same thing. It's, it's not everyone, but many hate asking for help. You might not call yourself desperate be, because you have an out. You have a, a, a safety net under you. You have drive or you are relentless and, 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 you're, and reckless enough in your belief to think that you can overcome anything. And some of that's admirable and great, but we often think of, of desperate as, as no options within ourselves. So if we just kind of use that, using that loosely, what makes you desperate? Where you have no options within yourself. Circumstances, what is it that, that is, is real or just imagined and feared? And, and the obvious, we can look at circumstances. We can say financial concerns. We can find ourselves in places that just feel really hard. And, and I, I won't say I, that we were desperate in this situation, but I remember when I was 25 years old, and we had just had Titus, like, in the hospital. He was born in, in January, so it was really cold. And we lived in, in our house in Trenton, and we had fuel, oil. And I remember uh, coming home as a husband and as, like, a new dad. And it was, like, you know, negative 18 degrees or whatever. And, like, we had ran out of, of fuel oil. Like, we had no heat in our house. And I just remember thinking, like, that's kind of a big miss for me, right? Not off to a great start, Right? And, and it was like uh, some like level of like, holy crap, like, Kim, I'm really sorry. Um, but then it was like we, we had people that we could reach out to and we you know, had some space heaters or whatever. And, and so, again, I'm not saying that we were desperate, but it was in a situation that felt like this is, this is really bad. And if we didn't have people around us, then we would have been in a particular way. It was on the weekend, so we couldn't just get it delivered. And so it was difficult. Maybe for you, there are, there are financial concerns on repeat in your life. Maybe it's relationships. It is my opinion that relationships are the hardest part of life. It's not the stuff. It's not taxes, although those are really frustrating. It's not paperwork and all the things. It is relationships, broken friendships, loneliness, kids uh, and parent relationships, and tensions, drama, shame. And, and even if you're someone who hates drama, like sometimes it's just around you, right? Fear of the unknown. Again, medical stuff or health or safety or security or whatever it is, like fear of the unknown is a, is a big deal. And some of it is fueled by realities and some of it is, is just pure letting the what if rule the day and the, and the peace of your mind. And sometimes you just put any number of these things together and it just feels overwhelming and all of it piles on and the sky feels like it's falling. So the first thing I, I recommend for us learning from Saul is to simply observe what makes you feel desperate, right? Desperation often comes from fear, and so we get to look inside, and we get to say, what is it that makes me feel desperate? It's good for us to be aware of what's happening inside of us, and it's particularly good to be aware of what's happening inside of us in light of what's happening around us and, and outside of us. And, and as you go about your day, when you wake up to the point to where you lay down, wherever that is and whatever happens in between, it's really this play of things that there's something happening outside of you. And some, some days you might be getting to end, be like, that eh, was fine, like nothing significant. But honestly, that's kind of rare because there's just so regularly you wake up with something on your mind that has to be resolved or, or some tension that you have to like, right? And so we get to just look inside of ourselves and say, what is happening around me and, and how am I dealing with that inside of me? And, and there, there are breadcrumbs of desperation in our lives, day to day, week to week, month, year, decade, that are necessary to, to take us to the Lord, and that's really important. The second thing that we see is, is desperation. It pushes to unexpected places. And, and because we're mindful of what's happening inside of us, we get to say, well, how am I responding? And what is, what is happening through me in light of what's happening? So let's read here in this kind of wild scene, starting verse 6. 
Saul inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him in dreams or by the Urim. Basically, that's through like the priesthood or, or by the prophets. Saul then said to the servants, find me a woman who is a medium so I can go and consult her. That's not good. Remember, he had already removed all the mediums. And so he knew that, that publicly he had gotten rid of all this stuff because it wasn't of the Lord. It was forbade by God, actually. So his servant said, well, uh, we know of a woman. She's an indoor, which just sounds so medium-like, right? I mean, it's an indoor. Like, I don't know. There's a woman at indoor who is a medium. Saul disguised himself. It's literally Halloween. Like, he puts on a costume uh, by putting on different clothes. And we see this throughout the, the, uh, the scriptures. And he set out with two of his men that came to the woman at night. And Saul said, Consult a spirit for me. It's nighttime, that makes sense. Bring up for me the one I tell you. But the woman, she's wise. And the woman said to him, You surely know what Saul has done. Remember, it's Saul dressed up right in front of her asking for this. And she says, You surely know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why are you setting a trap for me to get me killed? So she's like, Okay, like you're doing one of those secret raids, right? And you're trying to set me up. And so what's Saul going to say? Then Saul swore to her by the Lord. This, that is not good, right? And so I know when we talk about uh, the Ten Commandments and you talk about, like, don't take the names of the Lord in vain, and you think that means, like, don't say God plus cuss word, right? Which is fair, but what it really means is, is don't wear his name in a way that is dishonoring of his nature. And so Saul, he, he, he literally blasphemes the Lord. He... he, he um, he invites God into the conversation where he is deliberately sinning against him. That's not good. As surely as the Lord lives, no punishment will come from you for this. He's like, no, I swear, like, by God, that, like, you're good. Who is it that you want me to bring uh, up for you? The woman asked, bring up Samuel for me, he answered. When the woman saw Samuel, she screamed, and then she asked Saul, why did you deceive me? You are Saul. So in this moment, verse 11 and 12 Something happens, she is made aware that he is Saul, but we don't know how, and she's also just freaked the freak out when she saw Samuel coming up from somewhere. And now, like, again, any of the explanations that we give for any of this is speculation beyond what's here, so I'll, I'll try to just help, like, you can say that she's a con artist and she's never actually consulted with the dead in her life. That's fair. And then like, she's like, oh my gosh, it's working. This is wild, right? <laughs> Which she screams. She's like, ah! <laughs> right? And he's like, what? What is it? And she's like, uh, you're, you're Saul. And so somehow she knows. Like her eyes see something that she couldn't see before. Uh, but we don't have all the details. So, so she sees this, this guy. Uh, who is it? The woman asks. Uh, bring up for me Samuel. When the woman saw him, she screamed, and then Saul asked, why did you deceive me? You are Saul. But the king said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? He's like, yeah, okay, it's me, but like, all right, like, I don't want people to know I'm here, and you don't want people to know I'm here, and so we're good, right? But the king said to her, don't be afraid. Why do you see? I see, I see a spirit uh, form coming up out of the earth, and the woman answered. Then Saul asked her, what is it? What is he look like an old man is coming up she replied he's wearing a robe and then you know Saul's like oh that's so Samuel he's always wearing a robe <laughs> then Saul knew that it was Samuel and he knelt low with his face to the ground and he paid homage so there's a whole lot of like this is actually working and 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 we should be saying the same thing you should be saying like wait what so so it actually worked like we should be saying that why have you disturbed me from bringing me up? That's what Samuel says. Why did you wake me up? That's his word. So, so he, he encounters Saul. Saul encounters Samuel. Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Samuel asks Saul. I'm in serious trouble. Again, this is really important at getting to what, where Saul is. Right? He, he's desperate. I'm in serious trouble. 
The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has turned uh, away from me. He doesn't answer me anymore, either through the prophets or in dreams, so I've called on you to tell me what I should do. That's all wild and, and pretty serious. So, some context here. Saul's ban on necromance, often called, uh, is, is engaging with the dead, or soothsayers, which is uh, fortune-telling, essentially, was, it's just a reiteration of Deuteronomy chapter 18, if you want to look at that uh, on your own time, starting in verse 9, but, but here's the gist. This is not new. They all knew that this wasn't of the Lord. This wasn't what God's people were to do. And so it says in Deuteronomy, explicitly don't imitate uh, detestable customs of the nations. So don't do what they do. You are my people, and you're going to live a different way. Uh, no child sacrifice, no divination, which is fortunes, no, uh, no consulting the dead, no spells, no medium, no spiritist. Rather, be blameless before God, and God will drive them out. And so the emphasis, the emphasis is, is on this reality that, that God is ultimately in charge of all things, the living and the dead, spirits both visible and invisible, and so we are not to mess with those things. This is not, has not just gone away. And so you, you interact with people who are into, and maybe this is you, right? Astrology, not astronomy, that's something different. But astrology and horoscopes and crystals and seances and, and Ouija stuff or Ouija boards and, and tarot cards and, and palm reading. Or, or maybe if you're from my day, like Miss Cleo. You remember Miss Cleo late at night, 1-800 or 1-900 number, and she was like going to tell you all that you need to know about your life. So you would call her and she would... <clears throat> Read the script or whatever. Uh, she did get in some trouble. Turns out she wasn't legit, all right? Um, so, I mean, maybe you have Halloween in view. Gosh. I, I was chatting, like, while Kim and I were passing out candy uh, on our front porch, I'm texting with my friend in, in Uruguay, and I'm like, hey, I, I told you, and so I'm showing him candy and people showing up dressed in whatever, and I don't know, he's in Uruguay. I'm like, is this a thing? Like, do you guys, is this really weird or whatever? And so we were chatting about stuff, and, and he's a believer. He listens to the same stuff we do, and so he's shooting me reels and fun stuff or whatever. But, but in the process, he's saying they're way more culturally conservative. They do nothing of those, like, it would be, a, it would be big trouble to be engaging in such a way, even as I was doing, sitting on my porch, passing out candy. And in that process, we, were, we, we reminded one another of this kind of thing that helps us in some way that we've talked about for years, that, that there are things in, in our culture that we receive, there are things in our culture that we, that we reject completely, or, and there are things in our culture that we get to redeem. Receive, reject, redeem. Really helpful lenses to put on when you think about how you're engaging. And I know some of you, I've already offended some of you, right? And we can fight later. It's okay, right? Uh, am I celebrating darkness and death and demonic things? Like, that's a thing you get to ask. Like, uh, just no offense to anyone here, but like, probably shouldn't dress your kid up as like the devil, all right? Probably shouldn't do that. But um, does it mean that, that, that he has to dress up as Moses. Like, is that his only option? Like, I, I, I don't know. Like, am I passing out candy and, and building community with neighbors in a way that, that seems like it's actually bridging some cultural gaps? Um, are we having our own party that's just competing with the world? And, and like, so for me, when I grew up, like the, the, the advent of the harvest party, big deal, trunk or treat, all that comes from not wanting to be like the world. And so fine. And I would just say, if you're going to do that, make sure it's better than whatever it is that they're offering, right? That's for real. And, and so all these things are a matter of conscience, and you get to say, this doesn't feel okay, and you get to seek the scriptures and, and figure out what it looks like. Um, don't be celebrating Satan. Probably don't want to uh, try to connect to the occult or, or communicate with the dead. But at the same time, the way that we engage with something like Halloween is, is a bit of a connection because like the next the next next holiday, we celebrate like some celebrate it as the day of gift giving and some celebrate it as like the birth of Jesus. And it and becomes like, okay, so we have a cultural Christian holiday. And I would say like me passing out candy 
is as effective to me worshiping Satan as it is to your non-Christian neighbor in the checkout line telling you Merry Christmas and them earning eternal life because of that. Are you tracking? Right? So we just get to look at, is it, is it any different or any better? Well, I, I don't know. We get to operate within conscience in the way that we engage this world around us. Um, and we get to do so with integrity according to the scriptures. Now, the craziest thing in all of this is that it actually works. That Saul goes to a medium and he engages with, maybe it's a hologram, maybe she's got some wild something under the table, but it scared her and it seems like he's engaging with Samuel. And so, how will I explain that to you? I, I have no idea. I have no idea what's happening. It works. It seems to be God being God, not a prescription for us to directly disobey God that we might encounter him. In fact, if you're trying, if you are sinning and you find God in that sin, you're probably not in a good place, right? And that's what, that's exactly what happens to Saul. Although God has spoken this way, uh, it doesn't mean that this is the way that God speaks, and it's certainly not the way that we seek to hear him. He has spoken through donkeys in Scripture, and, and it would take you, you would have to be a pretty desperate situation to go into the back of your farm and start asking a donkey for help. And that's not even sinful. This is actually prohibited from the Lord. And so, So all that to say, there was much harm in seeking out and stirring up and reaching out to demonic or or beyond this life realms. And that shows up in in less dark ways when people even uh, find themselves, I, I would even say, praying to saints and praying to others who have died because we have no foundation in Scripture where we get to interact with the dead in such a way. To be clear, this was just another Philistine attack, and in another way, it's, it's not. There's, uh, I'll spare you kind of the, the geographical details, but it meant bad news for both a chance at victory. They were not going to win this battle. Uh, it was in the wide open, so the Philistine military would, would probably destroy them, and And the loss meant that they would lose a really important trade route. And so you say, gosh, every page of this is just interacting with Philistines. And why would this be so different? It was a little bigger than usual. But you add together that with the fact that Samuel has died, that David has departed, the Philistines are advancing. You you add that together with God not speaking to Saul and you have a bad day with nowhere to turn. And again, verse 6 and verse 15, they help us see this. He inquired of the Lord, he did not answer. And you mix that with verse 15, I'm in serious trouble, Samuel. The Philistines are fighting against me. God has turned away from me. He does not answer me anymore through prophets or dreams, so I turn to you. This, this narrative is about desperation, not how to commune with the dead, right? Uh, one says this, he says, the most helpless misery in all of life is to be abandoned by God. Whatever you thought left you despairing is nothing compared to being forsaken by God. And whatever you think or whatever you thought about the cares of this world, about not having, not feeling, not gaining, not being satisfied with earthly satisfaction, not having the funds, not having the fun, not having the relationship, not having the friendship, not having sex or power or autonomy or a feeling uh, like the sky is falling or losing good things or gaining trouble, the most helpless misery in all of life is to be abandoned by God. And, and if you know the scriptures, then inside of you, you're shouting to me, but God will never leave nor forsake. And you know what? You should be shouting that to me. You'd be right. But both in the Old Testament, where that is located in Deuteronomy, and in the New Testament in Hebrews, the encouragements are to God's people that God will never leave nor forsake you 
God's people. It's not to people in general. There is some evidence. We, we can go back and forth, and I've, I've read stuff on both sides that might support Saul being with the Lord in death, right? I don't have to, time to go into all of it, but, but maybe we'll get to see Saul in the new heavens and new earth. I, I don't know. But those promises are for God's people, that God will never leave you nor forsake you. And, and we find ourselves either hopeless, no one can find themselves in the presence of God, or universalist, everyone will find themselves with God forever, or finding a God that offers abundant hope out of this world who also draws lines of distinction and duration for how long his grace will be accessible. How long does he allow us to receive grace that overcomes all for all time? And what, what I'm saying is, is the invitation from God, it has an expiration date. That's true for Saul. That's true for you. That's true for me. We can talk about grace and, and God's mercy all day long, and there will come a time when it is no longer accessible. So, so all that to highlight the desperation of Saul and the links that he goes to find help. He has been forsaken by God because of his perpetual misuse of God and his people. He has rejected God and he only uses the things of God, his relationship with God, and, and the people of God for his personal gain. That's what's happening here. Saul is not distraught or distressed because he can't find the Lord. He's distraught or distressed because he might lose. And if he loses, he will lose the thing that means the most to him. And that's public perception. So God is, is done, and he's having none of it. He's done with Saul taking his name in vain. He's done with him swearing by his name, and he, and he commits acts of sin because of his desperation, and desperate places has gotten into, uh, that, that he has gotten into by disobeying God to begin with. So how do we process desperation, Saul's or ours? A couple quick things. One, we get to acknowledge how close we are to being desperate. That's not always bad. That is not a bad thing. We look at desperation as being like the worst because I, I, I don't have the fix inside of me. And so we get to say, man, how close am I to being desperate? Secondly, we get to consider the compromises that you would make to find relief in that desperation, apart from God. Because that's exactly what Saul does. He's in a situation, and he can't see the Lord. He cannot hear from the Lord. He cannot find him. And it causes him to, to compromise in, in, in serious ways. And then thirdly, as we process those two things, we get to listen to our heart's longings and coach it back home. In all of the scripture that talks about memorizing scripture, and we hear David say, your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And I remember being a teenager and, and like, I remember saying, that's a verse that I'm going to memorize. And then I thought, wait a minute, that doesn't do me any good. Because that verse is telling me that I have to memorize other scripture so that I might coach myself back home, Right? So, so your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. What, what words have you? Well, that's the word that I, that I hid, <laughs> right? And so like we get to, gosh, I get it. And some of you say, well, I just can't memorize anything. And it's like, okay, right? But you can tell me about stats of players that no one cares about, right? And you can tell me the, the, the facts about uh, fictional universes and, and, and books. And you can tell me all the things. Like you can do that. You just choose not to do that. And, and I understand. Like, I'm not a great memorizer either. That doesn't give us an excuse not to store this in our head and our heart so that we might, in desperate times, be able to coach our head and our heart back to 
the Lord. Submit all that we are back to Jesus. So my prayer is that, that I would feel half as desperate as Saul if I turned to the Lord and I couldn't find him. That's my prayer, right, for, for me and for you. And, and the last thing is this. Desperation invites us to meet God. And so I want to pick up in verse 16. Samuel answered, since the Lord has turned away from you and has become your enemy, why are you asking me? All right, so we learn a lot that God is actively against Saul. And, right, and this didn't happen overnight. We've seen the buildup. But, but Samuel reiterates, God is against you. Why are you turning to me? The Lord has done exactly what he said through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David. You did not obey the Lord. It did not carry out his burning anger against Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this to you today. So I said, when you sin and you meet God in your sin, it's probably, you're probably not going to get a good result on the back end of that. He goes on, the Lord will also hand Israel over to the Philistines along with you. Tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me, and the Lord will hand Israel's army over to the Philistines. Immediately Saul fell flat on the ground. He was terrified by Samuel's words. And he was also weak because he had not eaten. That's a recurring theme that we see. Anything all day and all night. The woman came over to Saul and, and, and she saw that he was terrified and said to him, Look, your servant has obeyed you. Like, I've done my part. I, I took my life in my hands and did what you told me to do. Now please listen to your servant. Let me set some food in front of you. You need to eat. Eat, and, and, and it will give you strength so you can go on your way. She's like, let me just give you some food so you can get the heck out of here. He refused, saying, I won't eat. But when his servant and the woman urged him, he, he listened to them, and, and he got up off the ground and sat on the bed. Like, you can just imagine, he's like gaining his footing. He's like just shaken by what just happened. The woman had a fattened calf, and she fed him, and she served it to Saul and his servants, and they ate. Afterward, they got up and left that night. This would be his last supper, right? And, and certainly there are some connections to the last supper uh, of Jesus. And, and it was at night, and there are some other things in there. But what we see is, is God invites us to, to uh, desperation invites us to meet God. God is not, however, an impersonal power to be accessed at will as Saul's sad tale illustrates. This is a, a note from a, uh, ESV Gospel Transformation Study Bible. How, for Saul, how far Saul has fallen. His royal career began with a special meal prepared by Samuel, after which Saul went forth to become king. Now he eats his last meal prepared by a witch and goes forth to certain death. A lifetime of dishonoring God can lead only to ruin. That's a harsh take on Saul. The way we, we respond to desperation, it takes, it takes a million forms. You and me and, and our neighbor, everyone different. You can be numb with entertainment or, or, or with substance abuse and just, just anything to get through the day. You can become completely dependent upon another. You let relationships define you. Some remove themselves from, from this life in hopes of, of nothing next or, or a miraculous departure into a hope-filled new world where we, where we just look forward towards our death and hope that we respawn as something different or something better or, or in a less desperate place. Desperation brings us to the end of ourselves. And what motivation landed Saul here the community of Salem, uh, whatever motivation landed them there, or, or your neighbor here, or, or even yourself in this place, in this moment, in this situation, overcome by fear and drawn to desperation, so hopeless that we look beyond the grave for anything that might reach back up. And again, we can empathize with Saul, right? If you've lost someone 
that's special to you, that, that when you're at your worst and you don't know what to do, you, you, you get it. You get how you show up here. You, I just wish mom could communicate. I, I just wish that, right, that's how you get yourself into a situation like this. It's tough to speculate. And it's tough to offer motive, but, but we can certainly sympathize and offer benefit of doubt to, to Saul and to Salem, you and me, long for something beyond what we have to get us through what we face in our most desperate places, to get us on to the next whatever it is. But the deepest, most heartfelt, most desperate longing that anyone has is for access to life beyond death. Why did Saul care if the Philistines overtook him? Why, why do we care about, about the things that, that show up in us? Here Saul longs for Samuel, his trusted intermediate to the heart of God, some of us for a loved one, some for wisdom that we can't possess, but the deeper the desperation isn't for circumstantial peace, it's for, it's for everlasting peace. And we're fooling ourselves if we think moment to moment, if I could just get out of this situation, then I would have, gosh, then it would be, and then everything. You, you are a liar to yourself. And I, I said it this week of, of my calendar of the last couple weeks, if I can just get through, if I, I can preach Sunday and then I have this thing on my, but then after that, then it's like, no, I have that. Other, if I could just, and we lie to ourselves in our desperation, if we could, God, if you get me out of this moment, anything, until the next moment, 18 minutes later. It's the story of our, of our life. It's not circumstantial peace that we long for. It's eternal peace that we long for. This, this world that we are in, but, but not of, if you're in Christ, it drips with desperation. And you may, even this week, put your hope in a candidate, in a career, in, in a cure. You may hope that it, that it helps you get through the day. It, it helps us make sense of, of every post and every tear and every anxiety. Like I was chatting with Kim this week and I'm like, I, I don't know if this is me seeing myself differently or seeing others differently, but I, I feel like I've been, not in a weird way, like gifted eyes to see every just ridiculous post that you guys, I'm, it's not you, it's everyone but you though. Every just absurd thing that I'm like, dear God, every outrageous commercial that's telling me how bad the other man or woman is, like all the things, but what, but what I've, what's gotten me through this time is to not even see the movement or, or the flag or the, the whatever, but, but to see the desperation under it. And then my heart's drawn to be empathetic. It's like, gosh, it's so obvious what they're longing for. Every candidate who makes outrageous claims like they're running for fifth grade student council, like we're actually going to have soda in the water fountains. It's never going to happen. It's desperation under all of the things. And so everything that we get to hear, it's just, it's literally like, like, like souls crying out. And it shows up on the surface in frustration and hatred and vitriol and all the things. But, but what we can do with our neighbor, no matter where they land on any of that stuff, is we can, we can empathize what it feels like to be desperate and to not know where to turn for hope. This everlasting peace is accessed in exactly, hear me, one way, one place, one person. And it is good news that that's the case. It's, it's everlasting peace. This shalom, right, that, that, that we hear about in Hebrew is, is found in complete surrender to the person Jesus. That changes everything about everything in this life and in the next. One says this, peace is a temporary pact. Shalom is a permanent agreement. One can make a peace treaty. Shalom is the condition of peace. Peace can be negative, the absence of commotion. 
I feel that. Shalom is positive. The presence of serenity. The place of being untroubled. And the beauty of the Jesus who came to die for us, to give us shalom everlasting, is that it's not based on circumstances. And one day we get to, we get to receive the anchor that's been holding us together the whole time. And, and all of the external circumstances will go away. But until then, we get to cling to the one who overcomes this world. Desperate times call for desperate measures. That's a phrase that, that means in times of extreme hardship, actions that might seem extreme become appropriate. And we know that it's often used to convey that in difficult situations, people do things they, they normally wouldn't do. Desperation brings us to the end of ourselves. And no matter what you have carried with you into that place, God is waiting for you to come to the end of yourself to confess your complete desperation to him. I, I, would, even, I would even go as far as to say this. If you've never been desperate before the Lord, then I'm not sure you can understand the nature of saving faith. And again, if we use the word desperation being something that we can supply within us, right? Like following Jesus is not like, hey, I've had a rough go my whole life, but like I get it now and like, hey, it's me and you, buddy. No, it's, it's I, am, <laughs> I am without hope. There's nothing in me that, that I can offer that would get me to be with the Lord and his people forever. And when you find yourself in that place, then you are exactly where you need to be to trust Jesus, maybe in a way that you never have in your life. So we get to let him offer a peace that surpasses understanding. That means it doesn't make any sense based on the turmoil in your life. That is exactly what we need to do now and forever. So as the band's coming up, I, I just want to read the reflection questions with you uh, really quickly. Um, where do I turn when things seem desperately hopeless? We get to wrestle with that. Am I trying to pursue God or, or do I just want him to deliver me whatever I'm asking? It's a big difference. Like, am I after him and trusting all that is candidate, career, cure? Am I trusting him or am I just wanting him to deliver me like Saul is doing? And what does any of this reveal about my relationship with God? We're going to ask some questions today. Uh, we get to respond. You can sit. You can stand, you can sing with the band. I think they would love for you. We're not going to give you a microphone. They would love for you to sing with them, right? You can pray over there on that prayer bench if you just want some space to yourself. Someone would love to pray with you back that way. My wife and I will be back here. We would love to pray with you. Um, if you are in Christ and all this is true, you, you believe and you behold Jesus, you've been desperate for him and you trust him for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life, then we get to do uh, we get to respond to it by taking communion, the, the Lord's Supper, right? And it's, and it's bread and it's juice and it's representative of the body of Jesus that was broken for us and, and his blood that was spilled for us. And we get to remember that as we partake and we get to declare that to one another here this morning. God, thank you for your, for your kindness to us. Would you do work in us that we just can't imagine. Thank you for, for all the ways that you respond to us and that you are available and that you will not leave and, and you will not forsake your own. And today, would you just let more people be your own? Would you let us find ourselves desperate and not turning to the things of the world or the places of the world or the people of this world, but to you and you alone? And, and would you deliver to us a peace that surpasses all understanding in Jesus' name? Amen.